higher, to draw closer to you, Lord. That's why so many of us, Lord, are choosing to fast and pray and seek your face, Lord. And Father, we're already seeing great things, and seeing your hand move in our lives and around our lives and in our families' lives. And Father, I just pray that the message you birthed in my heart through your own word will speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.
Lord, that your love never fails. No matter what, even when we don't understand, we know that you're always, everything you do is uh, good. It's always, everything you do for us is good. uh, We're going to worship that now. Lord, you do all things well. Ocean Tamer The glimpses of you burn in my eyes The worship of heaven fills up the sky You made it all, said let there be And there was all that we see The sound of your voice, the works of your hands you do all things well. You do all things well. You do all things well. Star creator, wind breather, the strokes of your beauty brush through the clouds. Light from the heavens touching the ground And you made it all, said let there be And there was all that we see Sound of your voice, works of your hands You do all things well You do all things well
sitting at your feet where I want to be oh when I am here with you and ruined by your grace and by your case I can't resist the tenderness to search again There's a deep desire that's burning like a fire to know you as my closest friend I'm deep in love with you
Thank you. Well, good morning. Good job on moving your clocks up. Yeah, you're going the wrong direction, Mom. My mom says, set your clocks back. <laughs> you know, it's funny because in my house, I have an atomic clock. It sets itself. Well, it's not synced up with the national daylight savings time. And so I told my wife yesterday, I go, listen, in a couple of weeks, in a week or two, it's going to kick up an hour. Where we don't want to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. So anyways... Uh, Hope your weekend was good. Mine was good. Uh, my birthday was yesterday. God gave me a great day. Uh, I asked my wife, Did I, do I get a birthday week? And uh, she said, no, it's called birthday. You get one day. I go, but there's so many people on Facebook I always get a birthday week. She said, well, those are liberals. <laughs> they try to stretch out, their, stretch out their birthday. So anyways, I get one day. So don't wish me. No, you can wish me a birthday. If you hadn't had a chance when church is over with, you can step outside. You can check out the trailer. The food trailer has finally arrived in Waco, Texas at Calvary Chapel. God is so good to us, and we can't wait to see what's next for us as a church and a ministry. Um, so thankful we already have such great outreaches with Brothers for Others. We just have another means to be able to be a blessing, especially when a disaster hits. That's what its intention is is to go to disasters and feed people right outside the, in, a, in a good, clean kitchen. So, uh, thankful for that. This morning, we are going to be looking at um, Hebrews, I mean, Luke, Luke chapter 13. And um, a couple of weeks ago, hey, <laughs> this morning we're driving to church. My wife says, you want a piece of gum? Usually we go get coffee, and uh, she goes, you want a piece of gum? I go, what are we, smokers? Yeah, give me a piece of gum, and we're chewing gum instead of drinking coffee, you know, chewing a lot of gum these days, but uh, I pray that if you are joining us on the fast, I know you're not supposed to tell nobody, and I know you're supposed to go in your closet and keep it a secret, but for many of you, it's your first time, um, it's, it's different for us, and we, we feel like we need to encourage each other during this time of fast because it ain't easy not drinking chocolate milk. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not easy at all. Breakfast don't even taste the same without coffee. You know, it just doesn't. But you know what? I'm thankful every time it's an irritation because then I'm reminded how strong my flesh is. It just reminds me, and I go, Lord, there was a time there was only water to drink, Lord. And I have to remember that, and I have to be thankful and just and, and appreciate my salvation and appreciate, you know, because listen, God is creator of everything and everybody, but he's only a father to some. He created everything, but he's only a father to some. And it's the father that we're doing this for. It's the father and our understanding of the father that we are saying to the father, Lord, we, we want to know more of you. We, we see the days that we're in, and especially the days that we're in, especially the days that we're in. You have to draw closer to him so you can find your security and peace in a shaken world. You know, let me tell you this. This is off subject, but let me just tell you this. With, with the gas prices and the inflation, Christians should not be freaking out. We have promises to us on how to stay above all that. We know how to rebuke the devourer. If we understand how to rebuke the devourer, the, devour, the, the devourer is rebuked. Yes, it does seem like it's hurting. It's, yes, it does seem like you may have to cut back on some things, but maybe that's God trimming fat. That's what the fast is all about anyway trimming the fat so a Christian does not have to freak out about the gas prices I don't like it either <laughs> you know I'm, I want to point a finger too but I forget who my supply is that trailer out there is debt free people People save their whole lives in a 401k plan so they can retire and put all that money in a food trailer and then pray and hope that they can get their money back. We don't have to worry about that. That's how God works here. 
in this situation. This building is the same way. We, we wouldn't be in this building if God didn't send somebody to give us the money to buy this building. We, could, we wouldn't be here. We would still be doing two or three. I wouldn't do two or three services, even in a small church. You'd have to first come, first serve. I'm only doing one service. I'm not doing three or four. I'm doing one. Anyways, I'm just, I got a lot going on. I'm 57 now, and I'm, I'm moving on, and I'm a new chapter in my life, and I'm excited about it. I'm just, but, but here's the deal is today's teaching is right on, right on. And it, that, that, isn't that how he works? The last time we were in Luke chapter 13, I mean Luke chapter, yeah, Luke chapter 13, Jesus is doing a teaching on repentance. The, they came to him and said, we're the Galileans, and something happened to him. It says in chapter 13, it says, uh, there was present at that season some who told him about the Galilean whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And they're saying, man, why did something so awful happen to people doing something so good? Were they really bad? Jesus says, listen, you, you, you got it wrong. Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? Just because somebody's suffering something bad, does that mean they're full of sin? Jesus is saying this, listen, if you don't repent, you're going to get it worse. If you don't repent, if you don't understand you, who you are and what's in your heart, I tell you, but no, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. So he does say that bad things do happen in the end, at judgment day, not necessarily in this life, because even David told us in this life, the wicked prosper, right? We see that happening <laughs> big time right now. Take that gum out. So Jesus talks about repentance, and then he moves on in um, verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Now let me ask you this. He's the owner of this field. Would he go looking for fruit? In a season when he knew fruit wouldn't be there. Or would he go look for fruit when he knows fruit should be there? Be, right? Because if you know your trees and you know how fruits work, you know when to go get fruit. And so you know when it should be there. You're not going to go to a fruit tree when you just put the seeds in the ground six months ago and expect a peach. You know that it needs to do this and get to a certain point. Get to a, and then after so many years, yes, now it should be producing fruit. So it's not like he's looking for something that shouldn't be there. He's looking for something that should be there. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Why is it a waste? This is, this is, listen, we know he's talking about people. That's the hard thing about Christianity is understanding that God doesn't always play easy with his words. Sometimes he puts the knife right to your throat. It's just, this is the truth. I can't help it. This is, this is what you're up against. It's a hard truth. That's why you can't play around with the truth and you can't sugarcoat it and you can't just make excuses for it. You got to, because the truth is right there, man. But here's the good deal. But, but here's, the, here's, 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 the, here's the, the most, this is the part, this is the part that shows us how how awesome he is, why he's a father. This is what we're about to read is what we're, we're going we're gonna to see how he is such a good father. But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone for just one more year till I dig around it and fertilize it, put caca on it. 
And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. That's the patience of God. God is Father saying, it's time for judgment. It's time, it's time to produce or move on. But Jesus says, hold on, Lord. Give me another year. Let me work on it. But then God, since people like me, you, 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 you. And he says, will you take the time to try one more time? There's no fruit yet. Because listen, you can look at your life right now and see what kind of fruit you have in your life. Look at your life right now. Probably go to your Facebook and see what kind of fruit you have. Go back on your memories. Look at your memories each week that come, each day that roll through there. Look at your memories and go back and see if you've gone further, if your life looks better and you're, you're better off than you were, moved forward. You, you're seeing dreams come true. You're seeing the things that you hoped would happen are happening. Do you see those things? If you can see those things happening, you've got fruit in your life. If you don't see it and you've gone backwards and you're in the same place you're at, you have no fruit. That's the, that's the truth. You, you are responsible for your own fruit, you and the Lord. But the good thing is there's cultivators right there to help you, come alongside of you and help you. How many of you have needed somebody to come alongside of you and help you? How many have had people come alongside of you and help you when you've hit bottom? How many? We all had that. Listen, when you're in the toilet, throwing up from a bad night of doing whatever, Jesus is right there in the toilet with you waiting for you to finish vomiting and go, Lord, I'm tired of this life. And he says, I'm right here, right down here with you in the midst of it. I'm the fertilizer. Man, I mean, God is good. Man, he sends cultivators. I want to be a cultivator. I'm tired of being cultivated. You should be tired of being cultivated. But, but here's the good thing. If you're alive, you're not in the fire yet. He hasn't cut you down and thrown you in the fire yet, has he? If you're still alive, you are not thrown down, you are not finished, and you are not fodder. You're not just for the fire. You have purpose to bear fruit. Your, your life's calling is to bear fruit. And look, we're not all peaches and apples. Some of us are pineapples. Some of us are mangoes. Some of us are grapefruits. We're all different. I went to go visit Eric Blair the other day, and he had some, what were those? Mangoes? Those little orange things we ate? Mandarins. Not mango, mandarin. Man, they were so good. I don't, you know, I've been so used to just drinking Dr. Peppers and coffees and Cokes and this and that that I haven't eaten fruit in forever. And I'm sitting there just eating all that fruit and drinking that water, just eating that fruit and drinking that water, going, man, what have I been missing out? Because God says that fruit is good. And He wants us to produce fruit. What kind of pr fruit are you producing? A stench, or are you a fragrance to people? Do people roll their eyes when you walk up and go, oh, man, that dude just got a bad attitude and he stinks wherever he goes. When you see somebody else go, oh, man, good to see you. Your fragrance is so awesome. I put, look, people go, do you smell good? Well, that's because I squirt it right here where you're going to put your face when you hug me. Just so you know, I squirt it right here, so you get a whole nose full and think I'm the sweetest fragrance around. Oh, you smell good. Even men go, man, you smell good. That's because I squirt it right here. Where's my clicker at? Let's walk this out. Let me just show you how important, how important fruit is. 
how important fruit is to the Lord. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, and the Pharisees were watching as all this is going on. Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Let things that you do and how you live show that you've got a changed life. Your words are different. Your your, 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 your thoughts are different, but it's a progression. It's, it's, it's a slow process, but you've got to be progressing forward. You can't just stay where you were when you said yes to Jesus. I'm talking to Christians here. I'm not talking to unbelievers today. This is a message for the believers. Now, if you brought somebody that's not a believer, now you get to cultivate or be a cultivator today. Therefore, bear fruits where they repent, and do not begin to say to yourselves, well, I was raised in the church. I was baptized into the church. You don't get to say that. Your life is your evidence, not your, not your ceremonial stuff. Just because you took communion don't mean you're saved. Just because you got baptized don't mean you're going to heaven. Fruit. Fruit is the evidence that people around you can go, yeah, that guy's on the right direction. We have, don't say we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, and that's who we are now. We are engrafted, adopted children of Abraham. How about that? How about that? And even now, listen, and even now, 2,000 years ago, even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut to the ground and thrown into the fire. It's important to God that his trees in his garden that are his bear fruit. This is important to him because others are the fruit and the benefit of the fruit. Just like I was the benefit of the mandarin. It looked like a baby orange. is what I want to call it, a baby orange, but that mandarin... Not throwing that in the fire, throwing that in my belly. Check this out. Now in the morning, this is ahead of us. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. Jesus is hungry. Imagine that. That's why I'm a cook. And seeing a fig tree by the road, seeing a fig tree, you just expect to see fruit. You expect to see fruit when you see a fig tree. That's just automatic. You see somebody in church, you see somebody praying, you see somebody, there, it's automatic, you expect to see fruit in their life. You just expect, they seem spiritual, they seem religious, you just expect to see fruit from their life. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. The leaves were fake because the, the tree's not there for the leaves, the leaves are there for the fruit. And so without no fruit, those leaves are fruitless. And said, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Now, of course, it's referring to Israel and their leaders, but that also can apply to us. In Hebrews 6, it's a hard, here's a hard deal, a hard saying. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So I'm telling you, it's not for non-believers today. It's for us. He's telling us, let's move forward. Let's grow. Let's, let's, we, we know how we got saved. We, we understand salvation. We understand forgiveness. We understand baptism. Let's move on. Let's quit fighting that arena of the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Those are all elementary things. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. That's referring to going back to trying to think that sacrifices and ordinances save you. If you say Jesus Christ 
it's not enough to save me. I need to be circumcised. I need to be baptized this way. I need to go and, and, and obey the Sabbath this way. I need to do all these things for me really to be saved. That's just saying that Jesus is blood. And if you pull away from Jesus' blood, what saves you now? What saves you now if you uncover yourself for the blood? Because it says, crucify him again. And put him to open shame, saying it was, it was worthless what he did. For the earth, which drinks in the rain, that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated. Receive blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected near to being cursed. Whose end is to be burned. And some people come and, you, and, and they seem like they got it and you try to help. And, and all they end up producing is just thorns. And that's unfortunate because we've seen that now that we've been a pastor or we've been a church for 20 years. And I've been a Christian for 30-something years now. 30 years. 30, almost 30, 30 years. Dang, 30 30 years. Man, the people that were with me at the very beginning, some of them are gone and dead from doing terrible things, from going back to the world. Don't run. What's there to run to? The fire? To be useless, you're never useless. Never, ever, ever are you useless. You're never useless. You just choose to be useless. You choose to be, you know what, just because a woman does not have a child does not mean that a woman doesn't know how to be a mother. Her, the instincts are inside of her to know what to do already. She just didn't have the ability like some of us did to do it. But God created all of us to be used in a good way to be cultivators. He knew we would all need to be cultivated. And so he put people in our lives to cultivate us. And then we become the cultivator. How beautiful is that? When you see your brother hurting, you're cultivating. When you see your sister going through something, you're trying to cultivate. You're trying to fix them down here. Where the problem is, the problem's always spiritual at the root. That's the only place. You can't fix a tree up here. You just prune it up there. You don't fix it. You fix it. You save its life down in the roots. That's where you fertilize it. That's where the caca goes. Because your mess... God will use to grow you. When you hit rock bottom, God's a bottom dweller. That's a good thing, man. That's a good thing. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. If you go to a church with a man who has five airplanes. If you're going to a church with a man who has one airplane, if you're going to a church with a man who has several houses, you know what, you know what good measure I was taught a long time ago about how a pastor should live? And it, and it just, it, it, I go, that's perfect. That's exactly how I want to be. A pastor don't want to be the brokest guy in church. He don't want to be the richest guy in church. He wants to be right in the middle. As long as where you're at in your church, you're right in the middle of people around you. There's people in the church making more than you, several. That's a good thing. You don't have to be the richest guy in church. He says, you'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so... It's obvious that you can't hide it. Every good tree bears good fruit. You can see it in people's lives. You can look around the room and go, I can tell who's bearing good fruit and who's not. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. There's no way. It can't do it. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. And thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Man, this is powerful stuff. 
for us. I am the true vine, Jesus says, and, I, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That means cleans us up. That we may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides. It's a beautiful word, in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide. It means he keeps saying that word abide. To remain. That means don't quit. <laughs> you hear me say it all the time. Don't quit. Quit trying to quit. Quit trying to quit. It don't work. Quitting don't work. It don't work. Don't quit. I don't care how hard it is. Don't quit. Don't quit. It's the, it's, the, it's the fighting through the not quitting that's keeping you saved. It's keeping you on point. It's keeping you on the right path. I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. But listen, if you're saved, you want to know you're saved and walk in that joy of being saved. Because you can be a miserable Christian, beat and tumbled before you get to heaven. Just like the thief on the cross. Who wants to go to heaven like the thief on the cross? Nobody. But thank God the thief on the cross can get to heaven. Lose everything in this life. That's why we go to prison. Because there's a lot of thieves on the cross in prison. Right, David? I just like the first one to remain. To sojourn, to stay right there with him. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. I think that all this, the brothers for others, the food pantry, the prayer groups, the, 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 the things that we have going on here are all examples of the fruit. Not that I'm producing, that you're producing. We're producing together. You're doing your part, I'm doing my part. We're doing each other. We're doing what we're supposed to do off of each other. We're, we're involved in all each other's lives and ministries. And let me tell you something. That's crazy for a South Waco boy to think that God would bring me such beautiful people from California, from such a crazy place. I thought people from New York were crazy. The California people. Something else. But I'm glad you were crazy enough to get down here. Especially, and even these Albuquerque people, I'm glad they made it down here as well. For without me, you can do nothing. My dad would say, amen to that. Say that about me, dad. Without God, I could do nothing. <laughs> he raised me. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. He sure says that a lot. And they're burned. If you abide in me and, abide, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. I just remember thinking, man, it would be nice since we go down there and started feeding do a good thing. Man, it'd be nice to have a food truck or a food trailer. I just said that in my heart. I remember when we started this church, I just said, Lord, we don't need to pass an offering plate. Lord, we, we trust you. You could, you, just, you could bring a millionaire, drop some money, and just take care of us just like that. And you know what? Several years later, he did just that. I'm not saying I have the ability to just speak things, but each of those things I spoke were unselfishly spoken, but they were gratefully prayed for and, and, and I trust the Lord. I trust. I see. If he can split the Red Sea. Man, if he can do the things that we've read about him doing. If he is the God that we know he is with David and Samuel and, and all these great men. Paul the Apostle. If, if he's that God, why can't we trust him to do incredible things? No matter what the price of the gas is. I know it's hard. And I, I know it's tough being human. Man, I was raised on chocolate too. I was raised believing in Santa Claus. I was raised believing in all those things too. And you know what? The world slapped me down. Learned some hard lessons about this life. It ain't what you think it is and how you thought you were raised it for it to be. It's a cruel world out there. 
There's, 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 there's child trafficking. Do you know how many children are missing in, this, in our country? How many times your Amber Alert goes off? There's a, there's a painful set of people behind every alarm. There are painful people hurting right now because this world has shown itself cruel. And in a cruel world, especially women who have been violated sexually, I can't even imagine what that's like. But to be treated like animals, to be treated like that, it's crazy, but that's the world that we live in. We can't sugarcoat the world we live in. We can't think that our kids are just going to be safe without us. We can't just think they're safe in somebody else's hands. They are our responsibility. We're to teach them how to live so that they can produce the right kind of fruit and not just stumble through this life. You don't just say, well, I'm going to let my kids decide. That's the stupidest thing you can do. The stupidest thing you can do is let your kids decide anything but maybe their haircut. Let them get their own haircut. Let them learn that one fast. Listen, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, what he just said, my father is glorified. When God shows himself to do the things that you hope he does for you in your life, he's glorified in that. And then it says this, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Our calling is to cultivate and be cultivators and to produce fruit. Because a cultivator already has to have fruit. Ask as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Listen to him. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love don't remember no wrongs. Chapter 13, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. You learn what love is, and at the very end of that, you just go, God is love. He is all those things that he says love is. And if he is all those things he says love is, I can rest assured that he is all those things he says he is. God is with me even when I fail him. Even when I stumble in my mind. Even when I doubt. Even when I cross lines in my mind. He is always with me. He's always patiently cultivating me himself now. Because I'm bearing fruit. And so when, when, when there's a time that, 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 that I infect myself somehow. My thoughts or whatever. Man, God is patient not to cut my tree down because I got infected. He'll be patient with me to heal me and get me right and move me on my journey. Right, little brother? We've learned some tough lessons as a family. My house. You get the idea. I want to move on to one more part that I think will connect. Look at verse 10. We're going to move on to something. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had the spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no way raise herself up. So, found this picture. I was watching people flee some bombing in Ukraine. I saw a lady hunched over like that. You know, she was trying to leave. You know, following the crowd. She was walking by herself. People had to help her. Imagine what that's like to be like that for 18 years. All you see is dirt and feet for 18 years. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Now, remember, it's the Sabbath. And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his donkey, his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? 
So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Notice how he said, be loosed. He used the same words as untying a donkey. It's basically saying he was doing the exact same thing that they do naturally on the Sabbath. Loosed their donkeys. Imagine you're that woman. Imagine you're that woman and you, you show up to the synagogue faithfully every Sabbath. For 18 years, I bet, or longer. Even before she probably went down, she was going to the synagogue. Faithfully for 18 years. You don't think that they didn't notice the hunched over lady? You don't think that all those religious leaders and Pharisees recognized the hunched over lady? Here's the hunched over lady. And on the day that Jesus shows up and he heals her, the first thing they do is go, you shouldn't have healed her today. Imagine hearing that. Imagine you're the woman that just got healed and they wanted you to be like that one more day. Just be like that one more day. You've been like that 18 years. You could have just waited one more day and done it the right way. Religious leaders, religious people, people in position can be the ugliest people. Can be the ugliest people. I recognize it. I, with everything in me, Try to learn to restrain my tongue, to never be evil, to never say nothing hurtful because of my position and, 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 and what my words can do to somebody. And I am a nobody. But my words, I've learned, powerful. Yours are too. Yours are too, but mine are very, very powerful. And a religious leader to say something like this, to, 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 listen, Cares nothing about people. Only about the position. There are people like that. They're more proud of the position than the person they are supposed to be in Christ. They forget about that. I'm supposed to be the servant of all. That's why you guys on Wednesday nights that have been showing up, you know what's up. Because I like to serve. That's, my, that's who I am. I think that that's the greatest gift God gave me is the, the desire in my heart to pick up after you, to cook for you, to serve you, to clean for you, to do whatever I can do. That's just my heart's desire more than teaching. I just want, because if I don't serve, I can't teach. If I'm not showing you, I can't tell you. I know that. But that's, my, that's, my, that's, my, that's what I think is my greatest gift. But I just thought about the cruelness of this world, that there are people like that. There are, there, there are shepherds out there that hurt their people. I, I listened. And you probably know the story. Big church. Years ago, John MacArthur's church. I don't care telling you his name. John MacArthur's church. They had a pastor on their staff who a wife had divorced, separated from. She didn't tell him because she didn't know fully that he was sexually molesting kids. He just was cruel to her at the house and she couldn't take it, so she separated. Well, they sit people over there to convince her to take him back, take him back, take him back. It's just not right. You're not doing the right thing. Take her back, take her back, take her back. He got on pulpit in front of all his people and shamed her before it came out that he was sexually abusing all these people. That guy's sitting in prison right now doing 20 years for aggravated sexual assault on children. That church turned her back on that woman because they said, you shouldn't have been there, you should have took him back. Even though we didn't know that he was doing all those things and we wouldn't have said that, they didn't pray it through or God would have showed them. They just were trying to be religious and just trying to use their position. Made me sick to my stomach that one person could be hurt by the church. Just one. I know people have been hurt here, but not intentionally, not for me. I couldn't live with myself to be ugly to anybody. To be firm with somebody, but I won't be ugly to somebody. Sick to my stomach to make me think that I could hurt somebody from my position like that, that I could 
do something like that. And I, would not, I, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be a pastor that's like that. I'm thankful for the heart that I have. I'm, I'm thankful that God loves me, that he saved me, that he forgave me of my sins and made me a new person. I was like this woman. And I, I mean, can you imagine it? Because when I got saved, I had long hair. I went to church. I got saved on a Tuesday. I went to church the next day in a tank top and shorts. Can you imagine if I'd have went in there and they stopped me at the door and told me to go home and change the day after I got saved? Supernaturally, the way I got I know some of you don't know how I got saved. I'll tell you one day. But the way I got saved was supernatural, and, and there was no way that was going to keep me from being saved. But can you imagine? But they received me. They accepted me, and they were country. I'm from South Waco, and they were from... Uh, Elmont, in the country Elmont, towards west. You know, this kind of music. (laughs) But that leg does that. Didn't even know that you could play music in church and then for for it to be hillbilly gospel music was even a weirder thing. But I liked it. I really liked it. Brought back some memories. Anyways, what I want to focus on is the woman. The, the, the endurance, the faith, the willingness not to let her own infirmity keep her from going to the synagogue every day. Maybe God hasn't answered your prayer. Maybe God hasn't given you what you've wanted. You, you, maybe, maybe you hadn't seen it for years. You, you've been praying for years for the same thing. You've been praying for something for years and years and years. And you didn't see it after two years and you just go, you know what, I'm not even going to try anymore. And you walk away. People don't see their prayers answered the way they want it. They walk away. People see things that they don't understand. They walk away. I was listening to Levi Lesko's testimony about losing his daughter, I believe it was. And, he's, and I heard him saying, we prayed, you know, the, like Jairus for his daughter. We prayed, you know, all these. We just knew that God was going to heal our daughter. We just knew because we were Christians. And we were claiming all the right scriptures. And we were claiming all the right, we had all the right faith. We had all that working for us. We were doing all the right things. And she died anyway. How do you reconcile that? How do you still say God is good after that? What you do is you learn God is not who you think he is. No. God does not always do things the way you think he should do things. He confuses us. I don't think he confuses us on purpose. I think he confuses us because we're still infants in light of eternity. Because we'll never grow up here. We, we just, we'll, just, we'll just get to know him enough to just go, I know who my daddy is. And then when we go to heaven, then we'll understand who our daddy fully is. Right now, we're just learning the process our dad has to take us through just to get us to himself. Because we just got to make it to heaven first. We got to get through the process of sanctification, doing our part, bearing fruit, doing the things that we're supposed to do to show that we're his. And then when we get there, then he'll really open the curtain. Right now, it's just getting to the curtain. To the door so we can see what's on the other side let me tell you something it'll blow us away it'll be the wildest dream you've ever had and you won't have to wake up from it one of these days you'll close your eyes for the last time but you have to endure you need to endure second Timothy therefore he's now the interesting thing about these letters these next few verses I'm going to show you Tim uh, Paul is writing to Timothy Timothy needs to be encouraged right now. He's a young believer. He's still got a lot to know. He's still got a lot to understand about being a Christian because being a Christian means bad things are going to happen to you. Being a Christian means people are going to hate you in those days. Being a Christian means they're going to persecute you. Being a Christian means you could be arrested. Being a Christian means you could be killed. Being a Christian means you could be stoned to death. Being a Christian means you could be flogged. All these things that, that Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, he went through. Shipwrecked three times. Come on, Lord, you can't give him a good boat. Three times his boat went down. (coughs) Three times? That's crazy. So Timothy kind of knows Paul's history and thinking, yeah, (laughs) I'm not sure I'm up for that. But let me tell you how Timothy first met Paul. Paul is in his city preaching the gospel. The people of the city rise up against him. They decide they don't want nothing to do, and they drag him out of the city. And when they drag him out of the city, they start throwing stones at him to kill him. 
There's witnesses watching all this. Can you imagine there's screaming, there's hollering, there's dirt, there's tra- I mean, there's smoke as they're dragging, and they pull him out, and people are screaming. He's, they're throwing the rocks. Timothy is watching. He's, when he first hears Paul, he's mesmerized by the words of Paul. His heart is pierced. He's, he's a, he becomes a believer, listening and watching. But as it unfolds in front of him, as Paul is being dragged out of the city, and they start to stone him to death, Timothy's watching him. It's, crying and sure not not knowing what's going on and all of a sudden everybody leaves and Paul lays there beaten bloodied and then he gets up healthy he looks like he'd been stoned but he gets up and he goes back into the city when Timothy sees that he goes I want that kind of courage I want to be that kind of Christian I'm ready. I'm ready to lay my life down for the truth. I'm ready to lay my life down for what's right. I'm ready to lay my life down. I'm ready to sacrifice what I have to sacrifice for truth. I want to do what God's called me to do. And I'm ready now because I've seen somebody else do it. And that's how Paul encouraged Timothy. Now Timothy is experiencing some of that. So he writes him a letter to encourage him. This is his second letter. Therefore... I endure all things for the sake of the elect. I'll go through everything I have to go through so that you can get the message. They also, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I do it because I want them to know what it's like to have eternal life. I want them to know the truth. I want them to know that heaven is real. Judgment is real. The fire is coming to consume the fruitless trees of this world. And then he says this, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we, also, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot, cannot deny himself. Chapter three, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering. That's putting up with stuff for a long time that you have to for whatever reason until God takes away love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. These are the things that make people run, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. No matter what, don't give up. Endure it, even if it hurts. And out of, all, of, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. <laughs> after, yeah, after he got beat up, after he got flogged, after that, then he got delivered. So don't think that deliver, deliverance always means before the pain. Sometimes it just means deliverance out of the pain, from the pain. But evil men, oh, yes. And and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will get less and less. We're 2,000 years from this. And it says, no, it will grow worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. You know, you can be deceived right now. You got to be careful watching the news if you don't know what the, what's it called? Fake something. Not fake news, but uh, deep fakes, where they can make somebody seem like they're saying something they ain't really saying. They can, they can make me, in my face, in my voice, say something I never said and make you believe it. That's coming, man. Deceiving, being deceived. But you, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them and f- that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Notice that you have to have a basic knowledge of the Scriptures to kind of help maintain your path, to to maintain your road, to kind of know what your boundaries are, to know know why your life may be suffering what it's suffering, because you got outside the boundaries. Got to stay in. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince. 
rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Now listen, on this one, he's telling him to be patient with everybody else. Do these things with your long suffering towards cultivating other people. Because some people are hard to cultivate. Right? Some people want you to cultivate them, but they don't want you to cultivate them your way or the Lord's way. They want to be cultivated their way, and we don't do it their way. Because that ain't cultivation, that's wasting time. Oh, because it says, for the time will come where they, where they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. We already see that happening all the time. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. I think that today I hope that you leave knowing that God expects fruit from your life and he hopes you'll endure it and you have enduring fruit, that you don't quit, that you grow, that you don't stay the same today, tomorrow, that you're moving forward, that you're making progress, that you're seeing the Lord's purpose in your life more clearly. Let me tell you something. He's ready to blow us away. He's ready to blow us away with all he has for us. We don't even know half of what he's got left for us. Can you imagine the world that we live in now 10 years ago? No, we're, we're so, this is head-spinning world. Head-spinning world and heart-spinning world. We've endured so much the last few years. It's knucklehead stuff. Crazy. Satan is working Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. But so is Jesus. So is the Lord. Today is the day that you can declare that you will be a fruitful tree. And that you will abide in the vine so that you can endure whatever this world's going to throw at us. And do not fear the gas pumps. God's got your back. Go read your Bible. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the challenge of your word. Thank you for the inspiration of your word. Thank you for the life of your word. Lord, we just are so in awe of you. We thank you so much for loving us. Look, look, we look forward to the new chapter, Lord. We're excited about being in the position that you placed us in so that we can be a light to the world, especially in our city, Lord God. And so, Father, we thank you for Waco, Texas. Thank you for Texas. Thank you for being the God of our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you.